chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and, and uh, we're actually going to uh, skip a, a few of these, one line of this, because I'm not going to try to pronounce all these words that I can't name. So just know that, that we're going to have a whole bunch of place names that we're going to skip ahead. You can read them, and you read them in whatever language you can figure it out. So. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven... There came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is, it, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, Ah, they're filled with new wine. <coughs> but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, we are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks to you. <laughs> now, some of you may have heard this story before, but I will tell it again because there's some new folks here. And, and I want to say that I heard my call to ministry when I was a teenager. I was away at a church retreat. I was away as a part of a, a walk to Emmaus. It was for the, for the teenagers. And I was one of these leaders. Uh, I'd gone six months before, and I got to be called back as a leader. And all of it, 15 years old, I... I got to teach people about what it means to have faith. Now, on the night that I heard my call to ministry as a minister, I was sitting on a bench next to a duck pond at the Triple R Ranch in Chesapeake, Virginia. It was President's Day weekend in 1992, and what was amazing was that it was one of those uh, really warm winter days. You know what I'm talking about? You know, there's always that one weekend where it's like 85 degrees and you're like, what's going on? Everybody gets their shorts out and then all of a sudden it snows the next week. That was exactly what it was like. And, and I remember that night the wind was racing uh, and, and, and the trees were, were a thunderous roar as the wind blew through them and the clouds were racing across the sky. The moon, the full moon was, was peeking out from behind these clouds. And I was sitting on that bench praying to God while all this noise is going around me. And, and I was saying, God, where am I supposed to go next? What am I supposed to do with my life? I was open to God in a way that I had never been before in my life. And God answered me. In the midst of that warm winter night, I heard God calling to me. And, it, and God was speaking the language of my heart. You know, here I was, 15 years old. It wasn't like I knew a bunch of theological terms. But God was speaking to my heart. In the lesson we hear from the book of Acts, we hear that the 11 disciples are gathered in a room. And in other parts of Scripture, we understand that, that after uh, Jesus' death happened and, and after the resurrection, even, even after uh, Jesus came back to them, uh, that for many, many times the disciples were afraid. And they were in fear, and they, would, they kind of hid out in this upper room. So I think we can imagine just how these disciples would act after Jesus ascended into heaven. You know, even though Jesus had given them the gift of the Holy Spirit to heal and to speak, even though Jesus had come back to them on the third day of, uh, day of resurrection, even though Jesus had spent 50 days with them teaching them how to be disciples again, they were still in that upper room waiting for the courage to come to them. 
And we hear in our scripture that on this day in the upper room where the disciples were gathered, the Holy Spirit comes to them as a, as a mighty rushing wind and, and tongues of fire come upon them. And they were able to speak in every language of the world. Now, what would happen if all of us started speaking in foreign languages and a tongue of fire came in here and the wind blew? How many of you would say, okay, something weird's happening? Anybody, anybody want to be racing out to your car? I think I'm out of here, right? The book of Acts tells us uh, that the disciples went out into the world and they began speaking uh, these languages to people. And people on the streets heard them and understood them and, and were amazed at these Galileans. I can imagine they were like these folks from Alabama or something like that. It's, it's kind of probably how they thought of it, you know. These men are speaking in our language. And some people thought they were drunk. Now, the whole 9 o'clock in the morning thing always gives me a giggle, doesn't it, to you? <laughs> Because unfortunately, I went to college, and I know people at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's, that's how they got through the rest of the day, was to start drinking at 9 o'clock. <laughs> but here is Peter the Rock, the one who denied Jesus. He's the one brought back into the fold, and he's the one that stands up and says, this is what's happening, folks. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy from the book of Joel. And Peter was able to testify to the truth that is God, and to share in that promise that God gave us through Jesus. Now, I still think that we need the Holy Spirit, and I still think the Holy Spirit is here, but we need the ability to speak in other languages, don't we? We need to be strengthened and taught how to speak about God in a language people don't understand. And I'm not talking about French or German or Greek. What I'm talking about is the languages of this world. A few years ago, I volunteered as a chaplain with the Fairfax County Police Department. And one night I was called in because one of the police officers um, had been hit by a car and was in the ICU and was uh, probably going to die. And I was called to be there, to be with the family at that time when this police officer was going to die. And I've got to tell you, it's a little bit odd to be a chaplain in a hospital. It seems that my job is, is one that doesn't have a whole lot of practical use in a hospital. Um, I don't have a medical degree. I, I don't know how to put sutures in. I, I don't know how to correctly read the monitors. I don't even have a lot of practical advice about legal matters. Even, even words lose their meaning when you are working with somebody who has lost a loved one. But the spiritual support that God offers through my presence is what matters. It's something I learned is about a ministry of presence. And it's something that any of us can offer when someone is going through a difficult time. It's not about me being a chaplain or, or called reverend or even a United Methodist. Instead, it is the Spirit of God. It is the presence of God. It is the imitation of Christ that comes through my presence with the family and friends and co-workers that is able to speak the mysterious language of faith to those who are hurting. Even when there are no words, even when all I'm able to do is offer a hand on a shoulder, the language of God was speaking in that situation. <clears throat> now, I remember having a conversation with the ICU nurse that was in charge of this patient. And, and we were just talking about, because uh, I'd been there for several hours at that point, and, and we, you kind of have to take a breath every once in a while to get away from the family and kind of get your spirit back right again. And I remember talk, talking to her, and she said, you know, all of our nurses are now going through training on spirituality. Now, this is about 15 years ago, so it's not like it's something new now. But she said they, they are teaching this in nursing school so that we know how to speak the language of faith to people who come with faith. And she said that I know who comes with faith and who doesn't because their out, the outcomes are sometimes different. And sometimes even their attitudes are different. And I say all this because the language of faith that we are called to speak, the language of faith that the Holy Spirit gives us is not only in the words we have, it's not only the words we share from the Bible, it's not only in the words of salvation we offer, really it's, it's even in our actions. It's in the silences, it's in the support that we give our, our fellow human beings at times of need. Sometimes our presence when someone is hurting is all that is needed to transmit the message that God loves us. Anybody agree with that? How many of you think the ministry of presence is important, right? Um, frankly, 
there are time, a lot of times I'm, I try to fill in a lot of words in people's hospital rooms, and I realize that half of what I'm saying is just to be thrown out. And what's more important was the fact that I was there. Now, I kind of learned something similar when I was a campus minister. And uh, it, was a, it was kind of a, a real, my first year as a campus minister was a wake-up call to me, because I was working with a bunch of 18 to 25-year-olds. And, and when I started talking about, like, well, you know, the story of Noah, right? And they were like, who's Noah? Or I'd say, you know, Moses and the Ten Commandments. They're like, what are the Ten Commandments? And I started having more and more of these conversations with people who had never, ever been to church. Or who had been to church, but it was only on Christmas. Or who had been to church, but was always in the nursery or stuck in youth group and never had gone to a worship service. And so I remember my first couple of years, it was, it was like, ah, I just spent 12 years preparing myself to be a pastor, and none of these people know what I'm talking about. And uh, so as, as we went through a couple of years, I remember my student leadership team and I were, were saying, well, what is the best way that we can speak the language of your fellow college students here? And so um, my student leadership team wanted to offer something unique, and so we started partnering with the music department. And we started bringing in bands to come and perform. Because, you know, frankly, think about it, everybody has a soundtrack in your life, don't you? And it kind of ends by the time you're about 20, right? How many of you still listen to the same music you listened to when you were in high school? Anybody? You look at my CD collection, it is all from the 1990s and before. Um, I wish I could say I listen to modern music now, I don't. So. Um, so we started offering a, a place for bands to come in, and so every Friday and Saturday night we would have, you know, five or ten bands come and perform. And over the course of two years, we had 200 different musical acts from as far away as Oregon come in and, and perform. And, and I remember that, that we would bring in dozens to hundreds of people into our building each week. And, and we had a lot of people say, thank you for doing this. And well, I can't believe you're a church and you allow this kind of music. And those are the kind of the word, things that were being said. You see, our students wanted to change the culture of nihilism that was a part of uh, college to, to have a participation in the greater community. And, and when, we, when we'd have these concerts, we'd have a prayer and invite them to come back for worship on another night. Or we'd invite them to come to our Tuesday lunch. In the course of my final years there, we offered radical hospitality and the love of God to our fellow travelers at that college. And we used the vehicle of music to transmit a message of hope and meaning. I think about Pentecost, and what I think happened there was that our church was born out of a desire for God to transcend the barriers of language, of culture, of race, and religion. God chose 11 people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at first. And as time went on, and more and more people became Christian, this universal message of God's grace has become known in almost every corner of the world. Now, I do think we're at a crossroads right now as people of faith in this world. I don't think we've done a, a, a great job at sharing the message of God outside the church. There, there's so many other messages being shared about the church, right? And, and unfortunately, we speak in code. Do you all know what kind of code we speak in? Anybody tell me what SPRC stands for? <laughs> you know what a DS is? You know what the UMC is or what annual conference or general conference is or judicial council? I could keep on naming all these names that are specifically Methodist. And unless you're Methodist, you don't understand exactly what I'm talking about, right? And, and even for those who are Methodist, you're still trying to figure it out. It's, it's kind of like I was a military brat and it was the same thing. You'd always have all these acronyms that never made any sense. We've gotten away, I think, from telling the basic story to embellishing the story so much that we've put institution building over people building. And we know that our church is not this building. The church is people who are impacted by the message of salvation, of resurrection, and grace. And the church is people who respond to the chance that was given to us by a living God. The church is a place where we can be reconciled both with one another and with a God that came to earth to overcome that vast separation that exists between our earthly existence 
and the everlasting existence of our creating and sustaining God. Now, I just gave you a very long, lengthy statement about what Christianity is, and I bet you thought I was speaking church speak right there. And I was. So you can see that, that even in our own language, we can make it difficult. When I became a Christian, and, and I, I became a Christian when I was about six years old because I had a Sunday school teacher tell me to accept Jesus into my heart. How many of you had something similar? How many of you had a Sunday school teacher tell you, why don't you pray and accept Jesus in your heart? And, and maybe it stuck, and maybe it didn't, but, but at some point you revisited that, right? And, and I didn't become a Christian because I knew the words of faith. I didn't, it didn't happen because I could speak the theological language of those who were insiders. If you had told me, asked me what a DS was when I was in six years old, I couldn't tell you. I became a Christian because I saw God at work in the people I knew and cared about. What impacted me the most was when I came to church as a youth and saw people acting with genuine faith. From a Sunday school teacher to a youth director to the volunteers who were my, my counselors to the people who faithfully tended the church grounds, I saw examples of people who were willing to give up their own stuff, giving up some of their time to give to the church. People were authentic. And when I heard my call to ministry, it didn't come out of a theological text or the Bible. It came out of a conversation that I had with God. It came to me in the language that my 15-year-old body, mind, and spirit could comprehend. And you see, I think God continues to reach out to us no matter where we are, no matter uh, what our intellectual abilities are, no matter what our uh, gift for language is, God speaks to us. Now, I hope you have similar stories about the church. I hope that you can tell me why you're here, and not just because you feel guilty, or because your mom or dad made you, that's my kid's excuse. I hope it's because this God thing makes sense to you, because you saw the light of Christ in someone else here. Now, there's a lot to distract us in this world. Can I hear an amen to that? Is anybody? Amen. How many of you are distracted by so many other things, right? Um, we are tempted by the shiny new things that people invent. I mean, how many of you watch the new Apple, you know, when Steve Jobs is out, oh, look, the Apple iPhone, we all were supposed to worship it or something, right? It came, um, we are tempted by a life of leisure and pleasure. We want to escape from our mundane existence, and we're given all these promises of heaven here on earth. And in our modern society, the bandwidth that announces that God loves you is, is crowded out by all those other messages that are vying for our attention. Now, we often say that Pentecost is the birth of the church, and in a way it is. It was the first time that the disciples were tuned into the Holy Spirit and were able to announce God's kingdom to the people in languages that people could understand. And so I challenge you this Pentecost to tune into God and to announce to your friends and to your neighbors and your relatives and your acquaintances about the love of God. I challenge you to get away from church speak. Show them how much you care by the actions that you do. Show them what it means to be a Christian through the ways that you lead your life. I heard somewhere that 90% of what people think about you and what you believe comes from observation, not conversation. Just think about that for a moment. That 90% of what people think and believe about what you believe and who you are comes from them watching you. It's something that uh, I think my kids do. They watch me. And, and they've picked up a lot of bad habits from me. Anybody have kids picking up bad habits from you? You don't want to admit it, but they do, don't they? And, and, then, and then you look at them and you're like, how did you start doing that? And it reminds me of that 1990s drug commercial. I learned it from you, Dad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? <laughs> When I spoke to 18 to 30 year olds at ODU, I, I heard the, the stories of betrayal and mistrust that they often told about people who were older than them. And uh, one thing I heard about was their parents. I heard an inordinate amount about their parents. Trust me, your kids know everything about you, all your dirty secrets. And they like to share it with their pastor for some reason. <laughs> They know if you're cheating on your spouse. They know the lies that you tell. They know that you doubt your faith. But also, your children think the best of you. They are filled with grace for you. I had so many kids who said, if only my mom and dad would just change a little bit, I would. I, I still love them. 
And oftentimes, they're just waiting for an opportunity to speak to you as an equal. And now that I've been here at Strasbourg and, and been with you all, uh, many of you are opening up to me about your own experiences. And what amazes me is that all the older people I know are talking about their parents. Their parents may be long gone, but they talk about the pain of betrayal and the pain of, of heartache. And, and some of you are carrying a lot of struggles that hinder your relationship to God and to others. Finally, we know that the church has not always been perfect. And we know that our clergy have muddied the message of God. And we've all gotten mired down in church speak and hindered the movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, my challenge to you today on this Pentecost is to discover the languages that are being spoken in this world. And, and here are some examples of those languages. You know, I still think you could have a, a conversation about God when you're talking about the Redskins and the Cowboys. I don't know how you would do it, but you, I still think you could use the language of sports. Can you imagine if I were one of those preachers that had sports analogies every week? I'd, I'd hit maybe about 5% of you, right? <laughs> or if I talked about fishing all the time. Maybe about 20% of you guys. There's the language of ambition. You know, there are some churches that, that everybody is out to be better, and so sometimes their preacher can reach, reach them that way. There's a language of universalism. There's a language of hedonism. There's a language of relativism. There's a language of libertarianism and, and liberalism and conservatism. There is a language of even white supremacy that we need to figure out how to speak to somebody in the midst of that. And, of course, there's a language of tolerance. I'm not saying we need to speak these languages. I'm just saying you need to understand them to be able to speak the language of God. We were given a gift on that first Pentecost to be able to speak in the languages of the world. And it's not up to us whether people listen to us. I mean, we're still going to have those people in the back thinking that we're drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. But it is certainly our responsibility to speak about God and to testify to what God offers this world. So church, go to speak. Go and tell. Go and sing a new song of God's love and grace and forgiveness. And go into this world speaking and living the language of love that God has given us. Amen.